Um, the picture here that you see, no longer will I suffer in silence, really has to do with the idea that most individuals who suffer from mental illness, and, and not most, but, but, but many that suffer from mental illness in a doctoral student program um, are so afraid of the stigma that is attached to admitting that mental illness um, that oftentimes they don't seek the help or they don't reach out um, and, and, and actually tell what's going on. Uh, and so this is my story about how I no longer want to suffer in silence. I want to talk about these very personal things um, that, you know, that involve me being, of course, not just the researcher, but the insider um, who's experienced these things. And I don't want um, people to feel as though there's not a platform for them to discuss these issues, because I think um, the mental illness, of course, uh, amongst doctoral students seems to be increasing. So I will start. This is really about autoethnography as a qualitative research method to study this doctoral student mental health. And I am a brand new <laughs> um, a researcher into autoethnography, but I tell you that it's been an incredibly transformative experience for me. It's been both really painful, but it's also been um, really uh, inspiring. And I, I don't uh, suggest that people go into, you know, autoethnography unless you really do have a support system available that you can refer to, uh, because it does bring up things from the past um, that perhaps are difficult to deal with. So we know that there are low rates of treatment seeking among college student populations. This is one of the reasons that it makes it more difficult to gather the accurate data about institutionalization, uh, therapy, or even dropping out of uh, a program. Right now, I think we sit at a staggering 50% of students who enter into a PhD program actually finish that PhD program. So what are we really defining here as mental health? Because, of course, that has so many, you know, generalizations, and it's a very broad subject. But specifically for this um, paper, for this study, um, we're considering it in reference to symptoms of psycho-emotional maladies, uh, those that commonly impact graduate students. For example, substance problems, depression, anxiety, eating disorders, and just overall distress. Um, and these are not necessarily um, you know, indicators of, of well-being, or, or they are indicators of well-being and positive mental assets rather than a formal clinical diagnosis. So it's not necessary that, you know, a, a student needs to go and see someone and says, oh, okay, you know, well, I'm going to diagnose you with depression in order to experience, right, some of these symptoms. Uh, how are we defining doctoral students? Now, this is a very interesting, um, you know, subject within itself because doctoral students, there is no typical doctoral student. Uh, they represent a wide variety of contexts and circumstances. Um, you know, the second challenge, of course, lies in the variety of their academic and career goals. So support systems in place need to remain attuned to the diversity of doctoral students and their circumstances. And this is why I believe that autoethnography and qualitative research can really help focus on these specific groups that have been left out in the previous um, uh, you know, academic research. Uh, and a recent report by the Council of Graduate Students in the Jed Foundation came out in 20, 2021 and it had some recommendations, but it also had some very interesting um, you know, quantitative data uh, that points to the increase in the anxiety and the depression um, that students are experiencing, uh, especially uh, in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. So there is also a significant uh, lack of research regarding just doctoral students and mental health in general. Um, typically, we kind of put everybody together as a graduate students. But again, as we've noticed, doctoral students uh, make up a, a completely different diverse group of individuals uh, than, than just perhaps a master's students. So in a recent finding um, by a dissertation, Jimmy Enzor in 2020, um, I found two very interesting points that he made. And one was that sex was one of the most frequent identified predictor of mental health outcomes. 
with males actually reporting significantly worse mental health symptology. Now, this is in direct contrast to several of the additional studies that have come out within the past few years. To me, this is indicative of an evolving situation. It's also indicative of the fact that at any point you give a survey, a student could be having a wonderful day or a student could be having a terrible day. And that is going to have an effect on the way in which they answer these questions. So we do know that socioeconomic status uh, was a very statistically significant predictor for anxiety symptoms. And that of course is related to financial strains or impending student loan debt. And don't get me wrong, there are many other things that are contributing, of course, uh, to the mental health of doctoral students, um, besides just you know, these, these two that have been pointed out in this latest research. What is called for is a qualitative examination of the combined influences of sex, age, socioeconomic status, and the anxiety symptoms of doctoral students. More specifically, whether that is based on a student's present financial status or anticipated student loan debt. Um, this is where I can speak from personal experience. This is my insider, uh, if you will, right? Um, there's also a call for further research in this area, right, um, where my insert I know, insider knowledge addresses the concerns of those of us working in higher education while simultaneously trying to receive a terminal degree. And also, unfortunately, because of the adjunct system, living on welfare. Um, it's not something that I imagined I would have happened in my life at the, at the age of uh, 45 years old. But I also didn't anticipate that I would walk away from a 15-year substance use disorder um, 10 years ago. So, you know, there's lots of things that we don't know that are going to happen um, throughout our lives. Um, recent articles on adjunct poverty, we've been talking quite a bit um, about SNAP benefits. We've been talking quite a bit um, about uh, food pantry programs that universities are providing um, to try and help graduate students who are experiencing financial difficulties. Um, but these are some of the articles that we've seen. Underpaid adjunct professors sleep in cars and rely on public aid. Uh, these university faculty members have advanced degrees and jobs, yet they're still living in poverty. Facing poverty, academics turn to sex work and sleeping in cars. This is not normal. Um, this is, um, you know, a, a, a byproduct, of course, of the sort of adjunctification, if you will, of higher education, where 50% of faculty right now in institutions is contingent. And this is very dear to my heart because, of course, I am an adjunct professor. And I'm an adjunct at, a, at you know, the, the same institution that demands, because of my adjunct status, I pay full tuition. So how can autoethnography help? How can it lead us to solutions? Because that's what we really want here. We want solutions that are based in research um, that can really help individual students be successful in these programs. And one of those, of course, is honesty. Uh, the researcher really has to create this inner trust, and it's a dropping of all the sense of need to feel secure, which is a very difficult thing to do, especially if you suffer from a mental illness like bipolar depression, which I do. Um, it's becoming vulnerable to the world. I'm opening myself up, inviting judgment. But in the end, what that does is it breaks down the barriers between humans right? It allows for this empathy, right? Sort of a common frame of reference with strangers um, because we're able to put ourselves in their situation. Uh, as Custer states, and this is a wonderful article about a book that he wrote, uh, empathy fosters an environment of understanding, cooperation, and transformation and healing because we set aside our selfishness in lieu of more altruistic and magnanimous behavior. But a big part of this is vulnerability. Now, Brene Brown wrote a wonderful book called Daring Greatly, and she describes the concept of vulnerability as this elucidation of physical, psychological, emotional, 
our spiritual insecurities to self and others. And it connects the courage and the fear with the comfort level of vulnerability that we are able to engage. So I am opening up my experience through this uh, method of autoethnography, which some would argue is academic suicide, uh, in the sense that um, these are going to be published works, people are going to know about some of the deep, dark secrets of my past, uh, and that could, of course, influence potential jobs in the future. Um, and you know whether people not want to work with me, uh, specifically in the program uh, that I just uh, took a leave of absence so that I could get the necessary therapy uh, in order to um, do better in that particular program. There are historical roots in autoethnography, and this really comes from this triple crisis of representation and authority. Um, there was a lot of skepticism towards these grand narratives of objectivity authority and research neutrality, uh, especially when we were studying culture and social life. Uh, so we begin to take what we call a narrative turn. And the notion is that there's a distant spectator is rejected in favor of the embodied, culturally engaged, vulnerable observer. So <laughs> this has been, <laughs> Um, one of the things that I have suffered throughout my life is how can I be more like normal people? Um, and doctors, psychiatrists, uh, you know, bosses, people within uh, higher academic um, institutions have all said, you know, tone it down. <laughs> you don't always have to be so honest. Um, you don't always have to share exactly what it is that you're feeling. And, and, and I completely understand that. But to me, it was, I know you speak the truth. And I've internalized that in this discourse and shall re repent. And therefore, right, I will try to be more normal by not speaking about what's really going on. And by not reaching out and by not telling people what's happening with inside me, I'm not getting the support and the help that I need. Autobiography or autoethnography is also reflexive narrative research. It entails the researcher, the practitioner performing a narrative analysis of his or her particular experience of a cultural phenomenon. But the researcher, right, and his story is also the focus of inquiry. Uh, it's a combination, really, of autobiography and ethnogra ethnography. So it's research into what's going on, but it's also giving you sort of this insider knowledge that's coming from the person that's presenting themselves. It transgresses and subverts the subjective objective duality of this research practitioner, right? And it is a narrative analysis of this insider experience. Um, which is an ideal vehicle for reflexivity in research and practice. Uh, as an autoethnographer, I have to go back and examine things that I have done in my life, uh, experiences that I've had, decisions that I've made uh, that had terrible consequences. And doing that from the lens of a researcher, I have been able to forgive myself much more so than if I did not understand the context in which those behaviors occurred. Now, substance use disorder has been an issue on college campuses for many years. My substance use disorder began when I was a junior at, at the college level. I did manage to graduate on time, but that substance use disorder unfortunately continued for the next 15 years. So I didn't actually have the opportunity or take the opportunity to get clean and walk away from my addiction until 10 years ago. Mental illness. We know that college students and mental illness is on the rise. Um, and we know this is happening not just at the undergraduate level, but at the graduate level as well. And we're not gonna see this go away. COVID-19 has had a tremendous effect on mental illness. And the more students that enroll, the more likelihood that we're gonna be seeing students that are developing mental illnesses, are dealing with mental illnesses throughout their college careers. 
Why is that important? Because we need to have the support services available for these students to make sure they get what they need to be successful. Now, critical consciousness, research, writing, story, and method that connect the autobiographical and personal to the cultural, social, and political, right? This is the critical consciousness. It's a form of self-narrative that places the self within a larger social context. This just isn't about my story. Um, it's not just about my story about being a drug addict. It's not just my story about overcoming that and then going back to grad school. It's about a larger picture here, right? It's about, um, you know, the, the, the financial constraints, um, things that interfere with a person as they're trying to be um, going through these programs. Uh, autoethnography really has a potential to raise the critical consciousness. It brings the attention to their being in it. It engages in transformative writing for self and others in the field who are unfamiliar, either unlikely or unexpressed. And using this to generate critical consciousness of not just social class, but identity and institutions themselves. Evocative ethnography is more of an emotive, radical, subjective, poetic, sort of free form rhetoric seeking empathetic understanding from the reader. And that's the kind of autoethnography that I'm involved in. But there's also analytic autoethnography, and this is a factual objectified reporting of the experience, much more like a traditional sort of empirical field note taking, if you will. And this is just a, 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 a a wonderful sort of example of, right, if the focus on Edo ethnography is a motive and evocative, then the reflective observation is what is, right? It's the observer of self in that particular space, right? It's either individual or it's part of a larger team, right? Um, analytic is a little bit more action, action research. It's outward, it's inward looking, uh, and there's usually a full team, right, of individuals uh, that are involved in the process. Now, the quality indicators of good autoethnography is its faithful and comprehensive rendering of the experience. It also transforms the author through self-explication. It informs the reader of the unfamiliar, like I said, the unlikely and the unexpressed. This is kind of a, a, a little bit of a timeline because I wanted to personalize this for you. Um, at 25, uh, in my drug addiction, I was a single mom and I was a beginning teacher. Um, and that was in 2002. At 35, uh, this was one year before I uh, managed to get off of the opioids. And you can barely see, but right here are, unfortunately, the track marks of my active addiction. Um, there is, again, a bigger story here uh, because women, especially mothers in addiction, are treated much differently uh, than when men go and seek help for their treatment. Um, so mothers um, tend to be looked down. There's a lot more shame. There's a lot more guilt. Um, it's a lot more difficult to explain uh, when you don't have custody of your children. And yet you have gone through all of this and you have 10 years clean. Now at 36, at one year clean, I was able to finish my MA and it was a wonderful experience. And then I got to go on to teach um, at the adjunct level. And then because of my staying clean um, and pursuing my dream of being in academia, I was able even to go on trips to other places. And I wanted to show you this because when I joined this doctoral program um, in the education department, I gravitated to research that represented my life story, but I had no idea that this was going to lead me down a path that nearly broke me emotionally. And the reason was COVID-19, on-land transition, and a very fragile mental state that led to a 30-pound weight loss and ultimately a leave of absence in order to seek the kind of therapy and help that I needed to get better. So what I'm trying to say is that, you know, this is a personal story, but it's a larger story as well. Now, the growing movement to validate this is acceptable research, 
the combination of quantitative, constructive, and autoethnographic auto perspectives could really potentially add a new layer of depth and richness to that data that originally seemed sort of flat and sparse after statistical data analysis alone. I'm not just another statistic. I am an individual that has lived through this. I'm an individual that is living through this. And I'm an individual that is willing to become incredibly vulnerable and put myself and my career on the line so that I can pave the way for other individuals to do the same. Any questions? <laughs>